Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Today we're going to talk about the thing that confuses a lot of people between whether you are being detained or being arrested, especially when you're at the roadside in a car that's just been pulled over by the police officers. And uh, if you watch many of the videos like I do on YouTube of people who film their own interaction with the cops, or if you watch TV shows like Cops or others like that, you'll know that the common thing that many people do is when they get pulled over and they want to give the police officer a hard time, they'll say, well, am I under arrest? And the officer will say no. And then they'll say, oh, then I'm free to go. And the officer will say, no, you're not free to go. Oh, so I'm under arrest. As if those are binary propositions. And they're not. And here's the thing. This is something that is so well established in the fields of both law enforcement and law that it's an idiotic argument. It's an idiotic argument. And, and what's funny is you'll see a lot of times that the police officers just kind of shake their heads because it's not their job to explain the law to you. But it's such a dumb argument to make. Well, if I'm not free to go, I must be under arrest. No, that's not how it works. And the reason that we know that's not how it works is that the U.S. Supreme Court has said that's not how it works. And in case you slept through seventh grade or whatever grade it is they teach uh, civics in now, um, the Supreme Court is the highest interpreter of the law in our land. And when they say something, it becomes the law. And that's the law. And, and the Supreme Court has repeatedly, repeatedly ruled that you can be t detained and that's not an arrest. So all the things that attach or become available to you when you're arrested don't apply to when you've been detained. So you'll see people, they get pulled over, cop walks up, let me see your driver's license and registration. And they go, am I under arrest? And the officer goes, no, let me see your stuff. And they go, well, am I free to go? He goes, no, can I see your driver's license? Well, since I'm under arrest, I'm invoking my right to remain silent. You don't have a right to remain silent when you've been detained versus when you're under arrest. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about a Supreme Court case. I, I poked around and I tried to find a Supreme Court case that explained this clearly. And, and many Supreme Court cases, they're not written for the average person. And many of them are lengthy and contain a lot of legalese. But I tried to find one where the Supreme Court explained pretty clearly the distinction between being arrested and being detained. And I found the case that I like, United States versus Sharp from 1985. A drug enforcement administration agent while patrolling a highway in an area under surveillance for suspected drug trafficking noticed an apparently overloaded truck with an attached camper traveling along with a Pontiac. Respondent Savage was driving the truck and Respondent Sharp was driving the Pontiac. After following the two vehicles for about 20 miles, the agent decided to make an investigative stop and radioed the South Carolina State Highway Patrol for assistance. An officer responded, and he and the DEA agent continued to follow the two vehicles. When they attempted to stop the vehicles, the Pontiac pulled over to the side of the road, but the truck kept going, so the officer pursued. After identifying himself and obtaining identification from Sharp, the DEA agent attempted to radio the State Highway Patrol officer but was unable to contact him to see if he had stopped the truck. So he radioed the local police for help. In the meantime, the state officer had stopped the truck, questioned Savage, and told him that he would be held until the DEA agent arrived. The agent who left the police with the Pontiac arrived at the scene approximately 15 minutes after the truck had been stopped. After confirming his suspicion that the truck was overloaded and upon smelling marijuana, spelled with an H, <laughs> The agent opened the rear of the camper without Savage's permission and observed a number of burlap-wrapped bales resembling bales of marijuana that the agent had seen in previous investigations. I know it when I see it. The agent then placed Savage under arrest and returning to the Pontiac also arrested Sharp. Chemical tests later confirmed that the bales indeed were marijuana. Respondents were charged with federal drug offenses and after the district court denied their motion to suppress the contraband, they were convicted. The Court of Appeals reversed, holding that because the investigative stops failed to meet the Fourth Amendment's requirement of brevity governing detentions on less than probable cause, the marijuana should have been suppressed as the fruit of unlawful seizures. That's what the Court of Appeals ruled. So this case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And at the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court talks about the detention and how that compares to an arrest and how long a detention can be. 
which is one of the most common questions people ask me whenever I talk about arrests or detentions. People go, well, how long can they detain you for? And you'll often hear people say, well, 20 minutes. Well, the courts never said exactly 20 minutes. They've mentioned 20 minutes as a, not a guideline, but as a number that's in the range of reasonable. But here they will explicitly state that even that, depending on the circumstances, might not be the limit. So first of all, they point out that the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution is not, of course, a guarantee against all searches and seizures, but only against unreasonable searches and seizures. The authority and limits of the amendment apply to investigative stops of vehicles such as the one occur that occurred here. And then they mentioned Terry versus Ohio, where the U.S. Supreme Court adopted a dual inquiry for evaluating the reasonableness of an investigative stop. And notice they're not calling this an arrest. They're talking about an investigative stop, which is a detention. Under this approach, we examine whether the officer's actions were justified at inception and whether it was reasonably related in scope to the circumstances would justify the interference in the first place. Okay, so uh, they talked about another case called Royer where government agents stopped a defendant in an airport, seized his luggage, and took him to a small room used for questioning where a search of the luggage revealed narcotics. The court held that the defendant's detention there constituted an arrest, okay? Um, but there the focus was primarily on facts other than the duration of the defendant's detention, but it was the fact that the police confined the defendant in a small airport room for questioning, okay? So the plurality in Royer did note that an investigative detention must be temporary and last no longer than is necessary to effectuate the purpose of the stop. They didn't put a time limit on it. They did not say 15 minutes or 20 minutes. But they said that that man was effectively arrested because they took him and moved him without his permission, presumably against his will, and stuck him in a little room, okay? And, and they did those things, and, and they didn't have the, the probable cause to do that. So the point is that they are investigating you up to a point, and then after they do the investigation, they make the decision, do we have any reason to arrest this person or probable cause to arrest this person? Or at that point, should we let this person go? And, and there were courts that were saying, well, if, if you hold them for longer than 20 minutes or 15 minutes. But the point is that the Supreme Court has never said there is a specific bright line on that. Okay, We decided that an investigative seizure of personal property could be justified under the Terry Doctrine, but that the length of the detention of respondent's luggage alone precludes the conclusion that the seizure was reasonable in the absence of probable cause. Again, like I said, they, they, they grabbed the guy and stuck him in a room and held him there. But in assessing the effect of the length of the detention, we take into account whether the police diligently pursue their investigation. Okay, And presumably at the side of the road, they don't need all day to figure out what they're going to do with you. Okay, They're just going to need a little bit of time to examine the circumstances and see, what, see what's in front of them. Now, Terry, Dunaway, Royer, and Place, these are all these other cases that talk about the length of the detention, may in some instances create difficult line-drawing problems in distinguishing an investigative stop from a de facto arrest. But our cases impose no rigid time limitation on Terry stops. Okay? While it is clear that the brevity of the invasion of the individual's Fourth Amendment interests is an important factor in determining whether the seizure is so minimally intrusive, as to be justifiable on reasonable suspicion. Much as a bright line rule would be desirable in evaluating whether an investigative detention is unreasonable, common sense and ordinary human experience must govern our otherwise rigid criteria. So again, the police encounter you someplace, side of the road, walking down the street, wherever. They encounter you and they stop you. And they say, hang on, I want to talk to you. The moment they've detained you, you're not under arrest. And if you say, well, am I free to go? They can say no, because I'm doing an investigative detention. You're being detained. Now, I know people out there going, well, Steve, what's the difference between being detained and being arrested if I'm not free to go? Being free to go is simply one of the things, but there's other things, okay? But the police are allowed to detain you to do an investigation under the right circumstances, and that does not qualify as an arrest, okay? 
So the court points out in previous cases that they'd written, if the purpose underlying, underlying a Terry stop, which is investigating possible criminal activity, is to be served, the police must, under certain circumstances, be able to detain the individual for longer than the brief time period involved in Terry and Adams in these other cases. And then they also wrote, we understand the desirability of providing law enforcement authorities with a clear rule to guide your conduct. Nevertheless, we question the wisdom of a rigid time limit. Such a limit would undermine the equally important need to allow authorities to graduate their responses to the demands of a particular situation. The Court of Appeals decision, <clears throat> in this case, Sharp, would effectively establish a per se rule that a 20-minute detention is too long to be justified under the Terry Doctrine, and such a result is clearly and fundamentally at odds with our approach in this area. The Supreme Court refused to say that, yes, 20 minutes is good. Now, it can go over 20 minutes, depending on what else is going on. So, in assessing whether a detention is too long in duration to be justified as an investigative stop, we consider it appropriate to examine whether the police diligently pursued a means of investigation that was likely to confirm or dispel their suspicions quickly, during which time it was necessary to detain the defendant. And I mentioned this in a previous video, where the police pulled a guy over in Michigan to give him a ticket, a traffic citation. And after they did the whole rigmarole for the traffic citation, the cop hands the guy the ticket and goes, oh, by the way, can I search your car? The guy goes, no. Cop goes, well, sit here then, I'm going to call in a canine unit. And then he goes back to his car, calls a canine unit, which eventually shows up, and they search the car and they find something. And the Supreme Court in that case said, well, the guy had been stopped for a traffic violation. The police officer, after interacting with the guy, had determined, eh, traffic violation, wrote him a ticket. When he hands him the ticket, that's the end of the traffic stop. And, and they couldn't come up with a justification for, oh, and now we've just decided to randomly call in a canine unit and make you wait 45 minutes or whatever it is. And again, it's not necessarily a particular length of time, but it's the fact that the traffic stop had ended, okay? So, you know, they're allowed to detain you as long as they do it reasonably to investigate whatever it is they're investigating. And then when they're done investigating, they've got to make a, make a decision at this point. Do we arrest the person or do we let them go, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we talked about the Michigan case. So we readily conclude that given the circumstances facing the agent in the Sharp case, he pursued his investigation in a diligent and reasonable manner. During most of Savage's 20-minute detention, the agent was attempting to contact the other officer and enlisting the help of the local police who remained with the other defendant while this officer and the other officer went to pursue the other vehicle because there's two vehicles involved in this. So once the other officer reached this officer, and they found the guy who became the second defendant, he proceeded expeditiously. Within the space of a few minutes, he examined Savage's driver's license, truck's bill of sale, requested, but was denied, permission to search the truck, stepped on the rear bumper, and noted that the truck did not move, confirming his suspicion that it was probably overloaded, and that's when he smelled the marijuana, spelled with an H. So, this case does not involve any delay unnecessary to the legitimate investigation of the law enforcement officers, Respondents presented no evidence that the officers were dilatory in their investigation. The delay in this case was attributable almost entirely to the evasive actions of one of the defendants who refused to stop. So that's a problem also. You can't screw with their investigation and go, hey, hey, they're not doing their investigation right. <laughs> you generally can't cause a problem and then use that problem as an excuse in court. So... In conclusion, the Supreme Court wrote, we reject the contention that a 20-minute stop is unreasonable when the police have acted diligently and a suspect's actions contribute to the added delay about which he complains. The judgment of the Court of Appeals is reversed and the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. But you'll notice that the opinion continually talks about a detention, okay? So the police are out there someplace and you're someplace. And the two of you haven't interacted yet, okay? You're going about your life in your own little world, and suddenly your, your paths cross. The moment your paths cross, the police pull you over. Let's say you're in a car. You get pulled over. The moment they pulled you over, you've been detained. It's a detention. So when you say, am I free to go? The police officer can go, no, you're not free to go, and you're also not under arrest. Because you're not. 
Okay? And the Supreme Court says that they have a time frame within which they can, you know, do their investigation that matches the situation. So if it's a simple traffic stop, yeah, you shouldn't be there for an hour and a half while the cop writes you a ticket. But on the other hand, if you were fleeing and eluding and caused the police who are involved in this to go off in all kinds of different directions on a wild goose chase, and, and they finally do catch you and detain you, that detention might run a little bit longer. But a detention is not an arrest. A detention might become an arrest. Okay, you might get arrested after you've been detained. But the moment you're pulled over in a, in a, in a traffic situation, or you're walking down the street and a cop walks up to you and, and stops you and says, hey, I need to speak to you for a second, okay? And you say, am I free to go? He says, no, stand your eye. I want to ask you some questions. Now, how you respond to that is up to you, but you're not under arrest, okay? And so this idea that you can ask the magic question, am I free to go? All that's doing is confirming that you are either being detained or being arrested, but not <laughs> that you're being arrested because you can be held briefly, depending on the circumstances, and that detention is not an arrest. And the reason we know this is the U.S. Supreme Court says so. Now, you might disagree with the U.S. Supreme Court. I know many people who do on a variety of topics, people who think the Supreme Court is wrong, okay? But right now, that's how they've ruled, and they've ruled on that consistently. So when you're at the side of the road and you say, am I free to go? And the cop goes, no, you're not. You say, oh, I must be under arrest. That's your interpretation of something, but it's not the law. That's not how the law works, it's not how the Constitution works, it's not how the Supreme Court works. And for those of you who don't like how the Supreme Court rules on things, remember that the Supreme Court's actually described in the Constitution. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong neck of the woods in that one, okay? So again, a detention is not an arrest. Two different things. It's true you might get arrested after you've been detained, but they're two separate concepts. Questions or comments, put them below. Otherwise, talk to you later.